Good morning. Welcome. Welcome to people who are here in the sanctuary. It is so good to see you. Welcome to those who are coming in, live streaming from home. Welcome to those who are in the parking lot. And welcome to any who are overflowing into our fellowship hall. We just thank you. It is so good to see you. We are bringing our children inside for Sunday school. Um, we have uh, the air flow, which is kind of adjusted for that. So we hope that everyone will be safe. Thank you again for coming. The, uh, we have a couple of announcements. Uh, the first has to do with communion today. This will be our first communion back in the sanctuary uh, since COVID has begun. And uh, you'll find that uh, you are offered on the way in a small cups that on the top of them have a little pull tab and they will have the bread there a wafer and then there's a I believe a second pull and that will open up the bottom where the fruit of the vine <clears throat> when we partake uh, then just put the used cup in the little uh, cup holder in front of your pew uh, that way we'll get a count uh, and we'll also be able to keep it safe and separate also please fill out your communion cards so we do have a, an official counting for those of you in the parking lot, uh, you should have received these little communion kits and please partake within your vehicles as we uh, leave the uh, service here. And finally, those at home who wish to partake at home, please have your version of bread and fruit of the vine ready uh, so that you can partake along with us. It'll be a little different, but I think it will work out. Uh, I think it does honor to our protection of one another during COVID, and I believe that God really understands why we've made these modifications. So please partake if you're comfortable. Uh, during this um, uh, worship service, it was commented that one of the things that happens, the way we're doing it, <clears throat> is that you end up just sitting for 50 minutes with nothing else to do other than participate, and it's kind of hard to sit that long. So we are going to institute, I'll give you instructions, but we'll, a couple of occasions we'll ask you to rise during one of our worship elements uh, and then to please be seated afterwards. That's primarily for you here in the uh, sanctuary. Uh, <clears throat> the same thing, uh, please do not sing, but look at what we're doing, sing to yourself quietly, just don't do it with your mouth. Uh, finally, there is an announcement that it's in your bulletin uh, that has to do with Knit One, Pray Two. Uh, it will be meeting on the second Wednesday of October. Uh, this will again will be one of our first reestablished regular meetings since COVID. And again, the only thing if you're part of that is to please the mask, the separation. We want to be safe here. Thank you so much. Uh, are there any other announcements that anyone would like me to make that to call out? Okay, thank you very much. Let us now begin with the calling bell. <clears throat> In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Now let us confess silently, mouths closed, but hearts and minds open. Almighty and most merciful God, our Heavenly Father, we humble ourselves before thee under a deep sense of our unworthiness we have grievously sinned against thee in thought, in word, and in deed. We have come short of thy glory, 
we have broken thy commandments and turned aside every one of us from the way of life. Yet now, O most merciful Father, hear us when we call upon thee with penitent hearts, and for the sake of thy Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy upon us. Pardon our sins, take away our guilt, and grant us thy peace. Purify us by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit from all inward uncleanliness, and make us able and willing to serve thee in newness of life, to the glory of thy holy name, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Please rise for the assurance of pardon. Hearken now unto the comforting assurance of the grace of God, promised in the gospel to all that repent and believe. As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Unto as many of you, therefore, beloved sisters and brothers, as truly repent of your sins and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ with full purpose and new obedience, I announce and declare by the authority and in the name of Christ that your sins are forgiven according to his promise in the gospel through Jesus Christ our Lord. Please be seated. Our first lesson in this new sermon series <clears throat> is actually taken from Proverbs, second chapter, verses 1 to 15. My child, if you accept my words and treasure up my commandments within you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding. If you indeed cry out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk blamelessly, guarding the paths of justice and preserving the way of his faithful ones. Then you will understand righteousness and justice and equity, every good path. For wisdom will come into your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Prudence will watch over you and understanding will guard you. It will save you from the way of evil, from those who speak perversely, who forsake the paths of, un, un, of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice in doing evil and delight in the perseverance of evil. Those whose paths are crooked and who are devious in their ways. Here ends the first reading. The second reading comes from the book of Psalms. This is the beginning of a new sermon series that will be focusing on the Psalms, and it seems very appropriate to begin this 
time of instruction and time of learning with one of the most, probably one of the more familiar Psalms, Psalm 139. Hear the words of the Lord. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light around me become night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. For it was you who formed my inward parts, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me, when none of them as yet existed. How weighty to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! I try to count them. They are more than the sand. I come to the end. I am still with you. Oh, that you would kill the wicked, O God, and that the bloodthirsty would depart from me, those who speak of you maliciously and lift themselves up against you for evil. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. These are the words of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. I wanted to start us off with a statement to ponder. And that statement is that we are obsessed with art as a society because we identify with art. If not in our present, then in our past or our future. If not in reality, then in our dreams or our nightmares. If not with our eyes, ears, hands, nose, or, or mouth, than with our emotions. We are obsessed with art. Most of us listen to music or podcasts on our commute to work or the grocery store or to family members' houses when we clean. Most of us read or listen to books and read the newspaper and, artic and articles online regularly. Most of us watch TV shows or movies. Some of us may read poetry or appreciate the classics. Some of us like going to art museums, going to the different sections and seeing what all is represented there, how different people express themselves differently. Some of us like to play an instrument or sing. Some of us write blogs, write poems, write songs, or write about our days, even if it's something our own eyes will see in a journal. Sometimes we find a song, a poem, a painting, a lyric, or a quote from a book that captures how we are feeling in a way that we didn't know how to express in that moment. We are obsessed with art because we as a society identify with the concept of art and story. Something I like to do every so often 
As I go to Barnes & Noble, up there at the Promenade, or maybe down in Montgomeryville area, North Wales, and I walk in Barnes & Noble and I at least go to three sections, but I usually wander and go to more. I usually go to the Star Wars section because I do like reading about Darth Plagueis and Darth Bane and, you know, all those things that only Star Wars nerds would know. And I also like going to um, the philosophy section, the religious text section of different religions throughout the world, the Christian theo theology section. And, you know, I, I wander all over the place in there. And one of the things I appreciate is that when I go in there, it's not just one of my interests that's represented. It's so many of my interests I could find. And when I look around the store and I see so many people smiling or so many people just like picking up a book and considering it for themselves, I realize that we're all wired differently and that this place represents that to me. And when I go to each of these different sections, I perceive them differently. When I go to the history section, I don't look at those books as if they're novels, historical, you know, classic novels. Because a novel and a history text could be written at the same time period, but I don't read them as if they are the same genre of literature, because they both have different aims for what they want to re represent, even if they're talking about the same time period. The one just wants to say, this is how it was. This is how things affected the other. And then the other wants to say, this is how it might have been like to live in that period, to live at that time. So it's really interesting. And likewise, when I go to the uh, philosophy section and I look at, you know, ethics or, you know, a, a moral code, you know, I don't look at those books as if they are religious texts. I don't look at those books as if they are theology you know, or, or a Christian ethic that's talking about this is how God wants us to live. Because even though they have a lot of the same messages, they don't have the same method. And when I go to the religious section, and I look at the shelves that have all the Bibles that I could get, all the study Bibles that you could imagine getting, I look at those and I realize that a lot of people have the perception that this Bible is one genre, that this Bible is one book with one genre of literature, and that we should read it in the same way from start to finish. And I have to ask myself, when I'm in the history section, do I read it like a novel? No. When I'm in the philosophy section, do I read it like a religious text? No. And so it's very important to understand that the Bible has different genres of literature. And it helps us read it in how it was intended to be read. Because the Bible is more like the bookstore that I just walked into. The Bible is like looking around and seeing all these different sections and just being amazed at how many things can be represented and being amazed at how many people can identify with different parts in that bookstore, different parts in the Bible. How things stick out differently to some people versus other people. And how we can all contribute to our level of understanding that our uniqueness, our diversity, brings a clearer understanding of what the Bible wants to say to us. Our sermon series that we are starting is based on the book of Psalms. And it's called Poetry Paints Our Souls. Because the Psalms is a compilation of many authors over a period of time... And yet the Psalms are, and their poetry, and yet the Psalms are able to draw us in because we identify with them at various stages and points in our lives. Because just like the bookstore, we usually don't have one spot where we, where, where we go all the time. Sometimes we need a little inspiration. Sometimes we need something to challenge our brain. Sometimes we need something to just sit back and relax and read on an airplane or read, at, read on vacation. Something that gives our mind an escape. And the Bible is filled with that type of diversity. And the Psalms are filled with poetry that meets us at various stages where we might need. And while we know that the Psalms is in the poetry genre, what we also 
need to think about is that there are several different subgenres within that genre of poetry. Now, different names have been attributed to these subgenres, and different people have different ideas for what they mean. There's books and books and books about what to do with the Psalms because of their diversity, what to do with the Psalms being divided into five main books, you know, and we're not going to get it all into that for this series. We're going to look at it, you as a Christian in, in our lives, us as a Christian in our lives, when we consider the Psalms, is there, do we know that wherever we're at, that there is some Psalm that speaks to our emotion that we're feeling in that moment? even if we feel abandoned, even if, if we feel completely joyous. There are seven main subgenres. There's psalms of praise, which we'll get to next week. There's psalms of instruction or wisdom. There's psalms of remembrance, history, psalms that talk about Moses, the Exodus. There's psalms of lament, individual lament. Now, lament is kind of this category in the Bible, and it's not just complaining. Lament is understood as airing our grievances for the purpose of wanting an answer or a response, but also airing our grievances from a place of accepting that they might be our new reality. And that's really uncomfortable to think about. But life is uncomfortable, and the Bible isn't afraid to dive into that uncomfortableness. And then there's Psalms of Lament as a community. Our community is mourning. Our community is crying out for an answer. Our community wants God to intervene. There's psalms for that. There's psalms of trust where we don't know what to do. We don't know what, what to say. We don't know what God is saying. And yet we trust that God is with us. We trust that God has a plan for our life. And that plan might not be the sunshine and rainbows as we expected, but that God is with us always. And then there's psalms of thanksgiving. Psalms where you're just so happy and you just want to thank God. Psalms where you, God brought you through a really hard time and you really yelled at God through it, but at the end of it, you're just like, thank you, because you taught me a lot. Each of these genres are valuable to us, and each of these genres can help, us, can help guide us through the various changes in our emotions and stages in our lives. When I was growing up, I saw the Psalms quoted on journals, on bumper stickers on, you know, various things of that sort. And it was always like the really happy psalms. It was always the psalms that were, um, you know, the, the trees of the field will clap their hands. It's, it's always the psalms that are just so cheery and jovial and wonderful. And there are stages in my life where I want that because there are stages in, in my life where I need to believe that God wants us to be happy, and God wants us to be joyful, and God wants us to experience the fullness of human emotions even at its brightest, and that we should be thankful for that. But there's also moments where I realize that those journals and notebooks and those bumper stickers usually don't quote the Psalms that really speak to you when you're at any other point in your life. In fact, the prevailing Christian culture of our society makes it seem that if you're not, you know, that, that if you're facing a rough time, that you might not be praying hard enough, that God must be punishing you for some reason. Maybe, or maybe he's teaching you a lesson. The reality is that God accepts us at every moment in our rejoicing and in our sorrow. And these genres of poetry that is in the Psalms paints what we are experiencing in ways that we may not be able to fully express. Because the book of Psalms is more than an inspirational text. It's a collection of life experience. It, and life experience in a way of sitting, sitting, at the, sitting at the proverbial foot of your grandmother or grandfather and just seeking their wisdom and hearing their life experience and knowing that no matter what you go through and you realize your parent, your grandparent, that they've gone through it at some point in their lives too. And that wisdom of understanding that they've gone through it and the wisdom of them guiding you through it as well. That is what the Psalms can do for us. And it's also an art gallery. It's something that we can come back and appreciate for years to come and it keeps changing. We keep noticing different things. We keep noticing a different color in a certain corner, and the painting just keeps getting more and more complex and more and more beautiful the longer we look, 
like any good art piece will. And I hope that we can gain a new appreciation for this book of Psalms at the conclusion of the sermon series, that we see it as a source of comfort and that we see it as a source of wisdom. Proverbs 2 this morning speaks to wisdom. It speaks that we should seek wisdom like silver, that it will save us from harm and evil, and that the Lord should be our prime source for this wisdom. Imagine if we sought wisdom and guidance and instruction like we do wealth. Imagine if we pursued it with the same tenacity as many of us pursue the American dream. Imagine if we pursued just growing in personal knowledge in our spirituality the same way that we pursue our careers, the same way we pursue our families, the same way we pursue being a good parent, a good man, a good woman. A good person. The sermon is about whetting our appetites for that kind of wisdom. The kind of wisdom that comes from, care, from a caring, empathetic God who understands our highs as well as our lows and gives, us emotion, and gives our emotions a voice when we don't know how to speak them. I want us to look at Psalm 139 again this morning. And if you wanted to open your bulletins and follow along, you can. I'm not going to read it again because it's quite a lengthy psalm, but I'm going to separate it into sections, and we're kind of going to digest that. If you find it easier to, uh, if you have your Bible on you to turn to Psalm 139, you can do that. If you find it easier to go on your phone and look up Psalm 139 on Google and go to Bible Gateway, then that's fine too. And if you're sitting at home and you don't have a bulletin and you're, you're using your phone for this, then I just want you to listen, and then you can reflect on it later. Starting with verses 1 through 12. This starts with, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. Then it ends with this, If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, in verse 11, and the light around me become night, even the darkness is not dark to you. And night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. And what this shows us is that the Lord knows who we are. God knows our thoughts, and God is aware of all the parts of ourselves, the parts that we show our family, the parts that we show our friends, and the parts of ourselves that we show no one, the parts of ourselves that only we know, and even the parts of ourselves that we're still trying to figure out. God knows all of that. God knows our light and our dark, and God says, I will never leave you. I am with you. I have searched you, and I'm still here. There's nowhere that we can go to escape the presence of God in our lives. I would say that this section here, verses 1 through 12, is a mixture of the subgenre of praise and trust. It's praising God for searching. It's praising God for knowing. But it's also trusting and saying, even if I'm in the dark, I know you're there. Moving on to verses 11 to 18. And this is the section where it starts off at 13, uh, verses 13 to 18. 13, for it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Verses 17, how weighty to me are your, are your thoughts, O God, how vast is the sum of them. I try to count them, they are more than the sand. I come to the end, I am still with you. And this section is all about God knowing you, even before you were born. God knowing the core of who you are, even before you saw the light of day. And then it ends with, you know, if you know me so much, how weighty are the thoughts of you on my mind. The thought, how weighty it is, is the thinking, the thought of a God who knows me at every stage of life, of a God who cradles me in their loving arms. See, God has been with us throughout our lives, has been caring for us at all times. When we take a few moments to reflect on that, even though all of our lives have good moments and some really rough moments, we can, with time, see that God has always been there. I would say that this section is in the subgenre of praise or thanksgiving. It's thanking God for being there, but it's also praising God that those are characteristics of our God, that God is always with us. 
Moving on to verses 19 to 24, and I'm just going to read it because I want you to get how stark the contrast is in, in, in the psalmist's language here. So he just, they, they just ended with, How weighty to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. I try to count them, and they are more than the sand. I come to the end, and I am still with you. And then the psalmist goes, Oh, that you would kill the wicked, O God. And the bloodthirsty would depart from me. Those who speak of you maliciously and lift themselves up against you for evil. Do I not hate those who hate you, O God? And do I not loathe those who rise against you? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked in me. There can't be, right? And lead me in the way of everlasting. Oh yeah, uh, I forgot to mention, the Psalms don't pull any punches. It's raw, it's gritty, and it's angry. In fact, if you ever read that text and just read it in your head with, oh, that you would kill the wicked, O oh God. You're not reading it right. It's, oh, that you would kill the wicked, O oh God. That's what the psalmist is communicating there. I know I woke some of you up there. It's okay. Um, <laughs> but don't we all have moments where we want God to respond? Where we want God to bring justice to our world? Where we're just angry? And don't we all have moments when our ability to let our anger take us over scares us a little bit? Don't we have moments where we're, we're sitting in traffic or, or we're doing something else and we're stressed out and something just you know, comes at us the wrong way, and we're really angry, and we're scared that we have the capacity to be that angry of a person. We're scared that we have the capacity to yell like that. Well, and then when we think that other people are so bad, we realize that we have that same capacity to become just like them if left unchecked. I gotta tell you, I just finished remodeling my bathroom. And, oh, the Lord heard an angry John a lot. Um, <laughs> my house was built in 1890, and I was doing flooring and tiling. Um, it wasn't good. Uh, I got it done. It looks great. But I was surprised at how angry I got. Remodeling that tiny bathroom. You know, around 55 square foot caused me a lot of frustration. Uh, <laughs> And that's, and that's what I mean here, like, we all have that capacity to get angry, and it's also important to look at this and think of it in moments of our lives when we are angry, when we are just angry at something that happened in our lives, when we, something that, that happened that is really brutal in our, in our childhood, or something that happened in our society that we're just really angry about. We have to realize that in the Bible, there is an identity for us of people who are crying out in anger for God to respond. Or people who are crying out in anger, saying, God, where are you? That there is some identity there. And for a lot of us, we may not get to that stage often. But for a lot of us, when we do get to that stage, we wonder where God is. We wonder, and our, you know, you know the blessed be the name of the Lord psalms just don't speak to us in that moment, do they? But, oh, that you would kill the wicked sometimes do. So, sometimes does. And passages like this remind us that God is not pleased by what we're going through. God's not ignoring it. And ultimately, God will serve justice to all the wrongs. And sometimes that justice looks like confronting the wrong and redeeming the wrongdoer. Like what God confronted me when I was angry with my bathroom and saying, John, you need to take a break. You need to just go fishing or something. Like, you need to step away. I would say that this section is in this category of lament and trust. In conclusion, I wanted to state my initial statement in full here. We are obsessed with art because we identify with art. If not on our present, then in our past or our future. If not in reality, then in our dreams or our nightmares. If not with our eyes, ears, hands, nose, or mouth, then with our emotions. The Psalms is a collection of poems 
written by different authors at different points in their, in their lives. These psalms are not only meant to connect with us, but are meant to give us wisdom and a desire to grow in wisdom and in our spirituality. Within the psalms are poems that will connect with us at different points and will be what we need at certain points. There could be a singular song that changes its meaning to you throughout your entire life. Remember how I was saying before that a good piece of art has more meaning and more meaning the more you look at it, the more you listen to the song, the more you read the book? Or maybe the meaning has always been there, but you're just at a different stage in your life where you can appreciate it more. The Psalms kind of does that for us. Like the psalm starts, like the happy-go-lucky happy psalms sometimes don't make sense, but they do make sense after you've been through a time of darkness, a time of valley, a time of shadow, and you're finally on the other side, and then you can finally say, blessed be the name of the Lord, and you are just so ecstatic that you have made it through. And that's when those psalms have their power. Poetry is woven within many, many of the books of the Bible, too. Jesus' parables were stories that gave his audience a message, and the meaning of that message grew as people pondered it more and more. Likewise, when Christ presented what we know as the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, you know, the blessed, blessed are the poor, blessed are the, are the meek, it's a poetic method because it focuses on contrasting a group of people with a reward or statement that they may not otherwise experience in their lives. The gospel of Jesus in and of itself is a beautiful piece of art with contrasting colors and statements when it boldly proclaims that God cares for the least of these, including when we are at our darkest of moments, and God calls us to paint the world in love-soaked redemption that Christ proclaimed in, in, that is greater than anything in heaven, on earth, or under the earth, and that he proclaimed through his life, death, and resurrection, that it is victorious. And so as we enter into this sermon series, I want us to start with something to do and think about this week. At every point in our lives, God is there. No matter what we're going through, no matter what we're facing, no matter what emotion we have, that God is there. This week, at some point, you might feel happy, you might feel sad, you might feel anxious, you might feel quite happy, joyful even, you might feel thankful. When you recognize an emotion, I want you to Google Psalms for that emotion. And I want you to kind of click through the different options and see, see if something really sparks to you, see if something really speaks to you. And if you, if you don't have internet access, then you can go back to Psalm 139 and see if there's something in there for you at that moment. And if there's not, maybe a classic psalm that you know in your head, like Psalm 23. Maybe there's something in there for you. Certainly Psalm 23 has lots of, mo lots of things in it that will speak to, you, to us at different moments. And I want, I want us to consider that, and if you want to, you can share with the church what you found. Because remember how I said how, how art is different for everybody? When, I, when you go to an art museum and two people are looking at a painting, one person may be like, eh. But one person, it might be the most beautiful expression of whatever they're feeling at the moment, and they say, oh my goodness, I love this. You know? I think it's important for us to be reminded that other people think of things differently. And so if you would like to contribute your understanding, what you found, I would encourage you to email the church office at info at firstucc.net or to call us during our office hours, Monday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. And just let us know, is there something that you connected with this week? Is there a psalm that you really connected with? And I look forward to reading poetry because that's what the Psalms are. I look forward to reading poetry as a church in the next few, few weeks. And I look forward to seeing all the things that I missed looking at things with my own eyes through knowing what other people are thinking, through knowing what other people are giving me through their own perspective. Let's end with a prayer. 
Holy God, we thank you for your guidance and your wisdom. We praise you for your guidance on those who wrote the many books and chapters in the Bible. We thank you especially for the book of Psalms. May we know that in you we can take comfort. In you we can rejoice and know that our God, who knows why we are so happy, can cry and know that our God knows why we are sad, can scream and know that our God knows why we are angry. Teach us all during this time to pull closer to you and to know that we are listened to and that we are heard. Amen. As we prepare to enjoy and celebrate the Lord's Supper, I just pray that these words just soak right into your soul. Let us break bread together. It is always good to affirm our faith. These are words that have been used for hundreds of years. Together, let us consider them in our hearts and in our minds as I read them from our Lord. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, Suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he came out to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life of everlasting. Amen. And now the world are gathering at God's table in huts, in cathedrals, and everything in between. Let us now pray a prayer of the people on this world communion Sunday. God of all nations, we give you thanks that we are all made in your name. On this World Communion Sunday, we are in solidarity with the faithful around the world. As we break bread together, we remember that we are still one body in you. 
even though we have different languages, cultures, and traditions, different ways of worship, praying, and praising. In solidarity, we drink the cup together of hope, of new life, knowing that your will is for your people to be one body. We are one body, but we are not the same. It is through the gift of diversity that we are able to be your body. We thank you and praise you for making us all who we are, individually and collectively. We each celebrate our own ancestry, our culture and ethnicity, our own traditions and heritage. Truly, through showing your love for all, through our love for all, may we honor be one. One in faith and hope and love, the gifts of the Spirit. We pray also for those who are in our who are on our hearts this morning, those who are church family and beyond, who are in need of their special care. This morning we pray for our president and all of those who are suffering from COVID-19. We pray also for those who are anxious, without jobs, without support, and most importantly, we pray for those without you. Each of us has someone special in our minds right now. Let us name them silently. And we pray that we can sign up for each of you now as you tell us the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. In the past, at this time, we've had opportunity to give our tithes and offerings as part of our worship. However, during this time of social distancing, we ask that you place your tithes and offerings in the basket in the narthex, or as you leave, or give it to one of the ushers in the parking lot if you are in the parking lot or in the fellowship hall. But let us now, in advance, give thanks to our giving God. God of all grace, we can never outgive you. As we give you our financial gifts, help us to use the spiritual gifts you have given us. We thank you for giving to each of us these gifts of your spirit for our common good. To each of us, you have given different spiritual gifts to serve you and your church, to build up each other spiritually. May we serve you financially with our giving and spiritually through ministry with our gifts from you. Amen. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. You who come to me shall not hunger. You who believe in me shall never thirst. In company with all who hunger for spiritual food, we have come to this table to know the risen Christ and the sharing of this life-giving bread. Let us pray. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord our God. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Taking a cup, again he gave thanks to you, shared the cup with his disciples, and said, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Drink from this all of you. This is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Loving God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts, that they may be for us the body and blood of our Savior Jesus Christ. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, and with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Through the broken bread, we participate in the body of Christ. Through the cup of blessing, 
we participate in the new life that Christ can give. To all assembled, including those in our sanctuary, in our fellowship hall, in our parking lot, and those who are joining us at home, please prepare yourselves for communion. If you are joining us from home, please have your communion elements ready for consecration. If you are here with us, please take your communion elements, included in the small cup you receive when you arrive. Hold them in front of you, the wafer and the cup, so they can be consecrated. And those at home, please turn to your elements so they can be consecrated as well. Consecrate, therefore, by your Holy Spirit, these gifts of bread and fruit of the vine, and bless us that as we receive them at this table, we may be united with one another, and we may continue faithful in all things. In the strength Christ gives us, we offer ourselves to you, eternal God, and give thanks that you have called us to serve you. Amen. The gifts of God and the people of God come for all things are ready. So take the communion elements and uncover the wafer. Please make sure you uncover just the top layer to get the wafer. And now together, here and at home, take and eat. This is the body of Christ broken. And now together let us pray. Eternal God, you have called your people from east and west and north and south to feast at the table of Jesus Christ. We thank you for Christ's presence and for the spiritual food of Christ's body and life. By the power of your Holy Spirit, keep us faithful to your will. Go with us to the streets, to our homes, and to our places of labor and leisure, that whether we are gathered or scattered, we may be the servant church of the servant Christ. In whose name we rejoice to pray. Amen. Jesus invites us to believe in him and act on our belief. He says, Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. When you open your door, we rejoice as you experience him in your heart and move forward to eternal life. He says, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father and I will make our vote with him. Merciful God, we rejoice with you for all who are saved by belief and grace, and all who keep your word to love others as themselves. Amen.
that really connected with you at certain points and you still, you know, really appreciate when it comes on again. A song can be like that. And I want us to take time this week to kind of investigate what are some of our favorite songs? How, how, how are they speaking to us now versus how they spoke to us then? How can they connect with me, connect with me at this current moment, whatever I'm facing? And go forth and be blessed and share the understanding and compassion and empathy of our great God to all that you interact with.